Joining us now is Kachi Ophia with stories trending around the world. Hello, Kachi. Please catch it this morning. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Abate. I'm Good ready morning. to catch it. Good morning, Tundun. Good morning, Good morning Rafai. Good morning, Let's begin it. what's yeah. trending in Nigeria today. Where a 33-year-old unemployed graduate identified as Ola Dayo Oyebowali on Monday took to the entrance of the Austrian state government office in Oshobo to beg the state governor for a job. Now, the father of three, who is currently a master's student, stationed himself at the state secretariat's entrance with a roll-up banner. Now, basically, Oladayo printed his resume on the banner, and he claimed that he has been jobless since January due to the pandemic. The banner read, Governor Goiga Oyetola, please, I need a job. I want to be a responsible father. Now, the job epidemic in Nigeria is vast, especially after, you know, we had to deal with the entire year of the lockdown, where lots of companies had to let go of some staff because of the effects of the pandemic. But the question is, has it gotten to the, I mean, it has obviously gotten to the point where this man has to print his entire C CV on a banner. But then there are different arguments to this conversation with some people saying that no, now more than ever, entrepreneurship is one thing that has really thrived. With a lot of people having to find one thing or the other they could do, you know, to sustain themselves as it's now a reality that the jobs are not there. But on the other hand is also feeling pity for this young man who's just trying to be responsible and is hoping that the governor gives him a job. But I'll be honest to say that the side that believes that this man could at least start something if he could print out an entire banner, that's not cheap to do. Maybe that could also be a business idea he could do for some other people. Well, maybe. Entrepreneurship requires capital, though, and we don't know what's in his pockets now, do we? But I saw this, and I True. thought, I've seen True. banners like this. I'm sure you have, too. There are some people who stand on the road, not just in Nigeria. I've seen that happen in America, for example. People standing on the side of the road with a banner saying that they need help like in recent times, but apparently during the Great Depression, which, well, none of us witnessed, that was really common, people having to stand on the streets with signs. So this, for me, is a sign of real dire straits and a sign of the times that we're in. But, you know, fortune favors the bold. A lot of people wish they could be this bold, but they're held back pride, you know, what will people think? This man is past that point, and that says a lot to me. That's really what strikes me about this. So I do hope that this um, gamble pays off for him, whether the governor will help him or somebody else who sees that he's in need of a job and needs somebody of his qualifications. The only tone of caution I'd like to sound is that when you're standing on the road, literally anybody could respond to you. And we remember the recent tragic case of Hini Umoran, who was, went looking for a job on Twitter yeah. and ended up being murdered. Yeah. You just don't want to fall into the wrong hands. Well, I mean, this is clearly an illustration of the kind of desperation that the unemployment rate in the country has imposed on university graduates. This particular gentleman, Olada Oyebo Ali, yes, he has three children. He's uh, pursuing a master's degree in peace and conflict resolution at the University of uh, Ilorin. So he has an MSc also in view. And all he wants is just a job. I hope that looking at his qualifications, uh, the state government, he's standing there in front of the Ocean State uh, Government Secretariat, will be able to find something for him to do. But if he gets a job, how about the millions of Nigerian youths who are out there who also have certificates and, mm. you know, who cannot find a job? Unemployment rate, 33.3%. Actual rate uh, is even over 50% when you consider both unemployment and on, under unemployment, underemployment uh, that we face yeah. uh, in this country, yes. But this is a trend that is beginning to catch on. Uh, there is also a story of a lady called Zena Badiyemo who completed her uh, NYSE uh, in February this year. She's all over social media now. You know, she has put her certificates there, uh, University of Ibadan Law degree, and also you know, uh, uh, Nigerian law school certificate, showing that she's been called to the bar. And she's asking law firms, financial institutions, uh, to come to her, her rescue. There is another lady, one name is Vivian, Daniel Vivian, a graduate of uh, the University of Lagos, who is also over the social media, you know, appealing to people to help her find a job. But in, in the meantime, she's already selling ching ching. And she's saying that, look, maybe these certificates are not useful. You can get these certificates and not find a job, so why don't you go and set up something? But it's not everybody that will be able to raise the capital to start a frying uh, 
uh, chain chain, or, uh, or, you know, on the streets of uh, Nigeria. So what is the main crisis that we have with uh, education in Nigeria? It's what is called the school to work transition. We've not been able to define that very well uh, over the years. And that's why you have people with, uh, you know, long list of certificates and they cannot find anything to do. Now, another uh, query that has been raised is that perhaps is the nature of our education and that perhaps, you know, the uh, instruction process should begin to focus more on entrepreneurship, teaching entrepreneurship, so that people don't have to go looking about for, you know, white collar jobs. Uh, you may have, uh, you may have uh, uh, Vivian Daniel selling chin chin, uh, but there are others who will join their friends and set up uh, what you, uh, fintech, you know, all kinds of businesses. The boys behind uh, Patricia, they are young boys. They set up the business themselves. The uh, gentlemen behind the Kuda Bank, you know, they set it up as young people. You, we have so many examples like that of innovation, but Nigeria must stop failing its youth. And that's why we have to take a look at the kind of education we give and to put measures in place in terms of school to work transition at all levels. It's not just federal government, it's at all levels, education being on the concurrent list. So are we going to get to a point in this country, like in Le Miserable, that Fantine had to sell her teeth before she could eat, before we know that things are bad? Kachi, let's not deceive ourselves. Things are very bad. And at least all of this, we are looking for 4.9 trillion that some MDAs have kept aside that we don't know where they kept the money. Things are bad. It's not easy. 33% unemployment rate is beginning to show in the lives of people. And that's what you're seeing there. Somebody that has a university degree cannot get a job. It wasn't like this in Nigeria before. In the 60s, 70s, for the fact that you finish university alone, jobs are waiting. The economy is not like that again. Companies are shutting down by the day. And please, not everybody can be an entrepreneur. I know a lot of entrepreneurs that are back to their day jobs now. In fact, they work their jobs and they're still entrepreneurs. The journey to entrepreneurship is an eternity one. It's a marathon. I know a lot of people that broke even as entrepreneurs. Things went bad. They had to go look for jobs. So not everybody has a tenacity. And that's why we need to create jobs in the economy. And the government needs to sponsor and support them. That's why we are all angry at what NEET that is trying to do now, that people are setting up businesses in the tech sector, you want to regulate them, you want to collect 1% taxes. Yeah. The government should be happy that people are being entrepreneurs and creating jobs in this madness going on, but you still want to tax them and bring them down. Talk to about, you, talk, you spoke about the fintech sector. See how CBN is trying to clamp them down. People can't buy, you can't uh, buy uh, shares, you can't buy commodities. The likes of Bamboo and the likes, they are being clamped down. The likes of Patricia and that are into crypto, they are being cracked down. Financial Times just did a report five hours ago. It, I'm sure it will, be, it will be a topic of the debate in the next days in Nigeria, the following days in Nigeria, that the Nigerian fintech sector has raised over $1 billion in the past two, three years. It is the hub of the world. I think every government should have supported them and be excited for these young people. But what do we see? We, we break them down. Honestly, so please. Okay. Quite honestly, Rafai, I mean, you said it all. You literally said it all. I was literally going to mention what you just said about the fintech companies, like, you know, creating an enabling environment for even these businesses to thrive. You know, every day it's one tax or the other that's, you know, affecting some of these businesses that are even trying to grow. But before we head out to a quick break, let's quickly take our next story. Where angry youths took to the streets of Ibadan, southwestern Nigeria on Wednesday to protest the killing of a 15-year-old allegedly by operatives of the state security network. Now, in the video circulating on social media, scores of angry youths could be seen protesting in front of the Oyo State Government Secretariat while they carried the body of the deceased. They chanted songs, they raised curses on those who took the life of the deceased, who was said to be on his way for his West African Senior School Certificate exam. However, the commandant of Oyo State, Amotekun Olayinka Olayanju, um, has obviously 
denied this allegation. Now, this also takes us into the very issue of Amote Kunin itself, where at the beginning of this, you know, we all understood that community policing is a civil responsibility. It should be guided by the highest respect for human rights. But at the end of the day, the legality as well is still an issue. In this kind of incident, if at all they can find a case to even take to court, is it going to be versus the state or versus an individual? You know, what is the legal backing for Amote Kunin at this point in time? How can situations like this be addressed? How can they properly be judged? Because at the end of the day, this amounts to another situation where allegedly a vigilante has taken the life of a citizen of Nigeria. So considering that this is a state-imposed security outfit, who is going to be battling against? Who are they battling against? Well, we'll take some other opinions, of, of course, from Dr. Abati Tindu-Rufai. Let's head out to a quick break on what's trending. We'll be back with some more thoughts on this issue. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show. Here on Arise News Channel, we're just speaking about the alleged killing of a 15-year-old by the state security outfit Amote Kona. I'd like to bring in Dr. Abati Rufai Tundun um, into this conversation. That's just incredibly heartbreaking. It's a tragedy. And say his name. He had a name. was Peter Okafo. He was a teenager. He had plans. He was trying to better himself. He was an apprentice, was a princess apprentice, when he was shot in the head while running an errand. It's unspeakably tragic. And we need to name victims and humanize victims. They're not just statistics. They're people. And somebody has to be held accountable for his killing. They have to be prosecuted. Yeah. And there is a law that backs Amoteco. It was passed in 2020 by the Oyo State House of Assembly, I believe it's called, Oyo State um, Security Networks um, Law. So there, there, there is a law that backs it. Now, I always hesitate to bash our security agencies. As George Orwell put it, people sleep peacefully in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. They are working for us and they actually die. Members of Amoteco have been killed as well. The, having said that, so it's not to tar the entire operation because of a few bad eggs. Those bad eggs, it's important that they be fished out. And this is why I find it disappointing, this sort of knee-jerk denial of what has happened. I, I would urge Amoteco to investigate within their ranks and expose and prosecute this person who has done this. Because we have already had more than enough in terms of police brutality in Nigeria. We cannot stomach Amoteku or other, you know, bodies becoming towing that path of the police that we saw with the um, NSARS protest, for example, which was just a culmination of years and years and years of police brutality against the youths. So the youth that have come out in Oyo State and have blocked um, a Mokola area, I am not surprised by their reaction, because if they do not act, then who's next? This is really unacceptable. Well, I mean, isn't this the problem with Nigeria? Every good thing uh, turns out uh, becoming a problem eventually. The Western Security Network, that was known as uh, Amoteco, was set up as an extra measure uh, by the governors of the Southwest to offer an additional layer of protection uh, for the people. And then, particularly in Oyo State, we have had uh, too many reports of the Amoteco in Oyo State, uh, you know, killing people. In December 2020, the Amoteco in Oyo State was accused of uh, killing, uh, you know, uh, two persons. In July, during the um, Idel Kabi uh, festival, two persons were also killed at a party, uh, and the uh, Amoteku in Oyo State was also involved. Although at the time, the Commander General, uh, I think his name is uh, Colonel Olayenka, you know, denied that uh, Amoteku operatives in Oyo State were, uh, were involved. And now you have the case of this 15-year-old uh, uh, printing press apprentice uh, who was gone down. Uh, in cold blood, and the Amotekun has also been uh, accused. I think that the Commander General of the uh, Amotekun in Oyo State, you know, has, to, beyond just denying all the time, has to look into all of these allegations. And uh, the point is clear. There is no law in Nigeria that uh, sanctions, that allows, you know, that encourages extrajudicial killing. If anyone has committed an offense, there is due process to be followed. And these Amotekun groups and similar groups, uh, I thought we were told that they were supposed to work together with the police to apprehend and then hand over to the uh, police, not to go about shooting people. The standard excuse that they give in, uh, in Oyo State is that, oh, sometimes 
uh, these persons who have been involved in violence are OPC members. Could this also could it also be the fact that some of these OPC members are members of Amoteku? Sometimes they say it's just hoodlums, you know, all these uh, road transport uh, uh, workers. Whoever the person is, extrajudicial killing is not allowed. And I think beyond the protest, whoever pulled the trigger to snuff out this life of promise, uh, you know, should be apprehended and should be made to face the full wrath of the law. And Conan Ola Inka, who is the head of uh, Amoteku in uh, Oyo State, should provide the training for his men. Because this was the issue when they were saying that Amoteku should be given firearms. People had expressed concern that they could be abused because many of these persons, you know, they are probably not trained. They are either members of OPC or they are hoodlums or they are persons who have not been properly recruited. But going about turning the Amoteku against the people, you know, defeats the very purpose for which uh, the Western Security Network was established in the first place. It goes back to that long talk of who watches the watchman. So who reviews cases like this when Amoteku is involved and you hear a killing by Amoteku? Is there a panel? Who sets up this panel? Is there sort of like an ombudsman that you can report in fractions of Amoteku to? Does the law cover that? When they set up that law, did they put those caveats? And what are the penalties for things like this? Is there like a, a, an Amoteku Service Commission? Like we do have a police service commission. I think those are the questions we should ask. But most importantly, my heart goes out to that man, Peter Okafor, that has lost his life. Another great potential, another great talent, just gone. You know? Uh, <laughs> another unfinished greatness, because you don't know what that man could have become in the future. And we can't keep, you know, allowing people just die like this. The most painful death is the avoidable one. We could have avoided this. Absolutely, we could have. It's, it's Pitao Kafo. It's a very, very sad situation. I agree with you, Tun, it's essential that we say his name. You know, people need to remember and people need to understand how bad this network um, can be. But let's talk about another situation. Uh, Chloe Nicholson, a strip dancer, is suing for Houston, Texas strip clubs over allegations that they will not let black women work during their scheduled shifts because there were too many black girls working. Now, Nicholson, who worked in the clubs from the age of 18 to 24, is seeking damages, including lost wages from the clubs. She also described the clubs as a really toxic environment where black employees were commonly sent home. Now, her lawsuit covers a time period starting in 2017, and she believes that she has at least 20 former co-workers who experienced the same treatment. I mean... We are talking equality all the time. We're talking diversity all the time. I mean, they shouldn't be excluded from that conversation. Well, nobody should be. And it's so funny that this um, topic that you've brought is something that's often complained about by models. Even the top models all over the world have complained. I'm sure you've read about it. On some mm -hmm. shows and some seasons, they'll say black girls aren't trendy this year, which is just such a slap in the face. But they go home with their tail between their legs. But this Chloe yeah. is fighting back. And there's a, um, the Civil Rights Act in America of 1964, Chapter 7, is actually a federal statute. And it can, she can pursue her claim based on that. Because because it prohibits discrimination on the basis of color, race, you know, national origin, religion, what have you. So she can actually sue for lost wages. And there have been awards of in six figures, seven figures. But if she's able to prove it, that's the issue. That's the big if there. You need to produce evidence. There needs to be some kind of smoking gun that shows, that demonstrates that this was based on race. I don't expect that her employers will admit that this, they have this quota system based on race. So she no, might have a tough not. time. Yeah. She might have a tough time adducing evidence to prove it. Well, you know, I once asked uh, one of our guests on this program whether a time will ever come when racism will be a long and forgotten thing in the United States. But uh, I guess the guest, you know, said on that occasion that, well, nobody can give a definite answer on that. And since the civil rights uh, riots of the 1960s and the progress that was made to allow black students to go to school and allow women, you know, black women to sit, uh, uh, you know, inside buses and all of that, and then you had all that struggle. It's a shame that in 2021, 
uh, we still have stories like this. Uh, but the thing, of course, is that, look, every individual must assert their rights. And what this lady is doing in this case is to assert her rights and to put it on record. And we hope that she will get justice uh, because nobody should be discriminated against uh, on, the, on the basis of yeah. either color or race or religion. Isn't that the whole point about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, which has been domesticated in various uh, jurisdictions? But well, she's standing up for her rights, and I hope that her example will inspire others uh, in any profession in which they may find themselves uh, to insist that nobody should discriminate against them on the basis of color. After all, this was what uh, uh, the likes of uh, Martin Luther King made the ultimate sacrifice for. I mean, it's shocking. It's so easy for us to talk about civil rights struggle, but we forget that Americans fought the civil war because of black people too. So let's go back to that era and things have not changed. Over 100 years. So how, how much longer should we wait? Another 100? 200? Well, thank you very much, uh, Kachi. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning. Thank you very much indeed.